Take your Bible and turn with me to Joshua chapter 23. The story is told of a little lamb and her mother. Every day this little lamb would walk along with her mother in the farmyard going out to the pasture. On the way through the farmyard, she would pass the pig pen and the little lamb uh, would look at the pigs wallowing around in the mud in the pig pen. She started to think to herself how different she was to those pigs that wallowed around in the pig pen. For a start, it was a hot day and she was covered in this wool And there they were, no wool, wallowing around in the cool mud. She asked her mother, why don't we wallow in the mud like the pigs? And her mother simply said, sheep don't wallow. And off they went to the pasture. Every day this took place and the lamb started to grow and started to become a little bit more bold and a little bit more independent until one day she decided that she would reject the wisdom of her mother and she wanted to go her own way, do her own thing, make her own choices. And so uh, one day as the mother Uh, was walking along, she dawdled a bit to let the mother get way off. And while she wasn't watching, the little lamb jumped over the fence and uh, put in her feet up to the ankles in the cool mud, and it felt good. So she went in a little bit uh, further up to her knees, and it felt better. And so she went in up to her flank, and it felt great. So with one almighty plunge, she dived into the mud with the pigs and rolled around. And she was nice and cool, and it felt good. And she'd never felt like that before. And even though she was a sheep, she thought, "Uh, this is wonderful. This is marvellous. Till it came time to try and get out. There's a reason sheep don't wallow. Because what she thought would bring her great pleasure turned out to be her prison. Because she was stuck. She was stuck and she bleated and bleated and it seemed like hours went past and doom and gloom came over her and she realised how foolish she was and she realised how crazy it was to ignore the wisdom of her mother and how daft she was to have gone, uh, but it was too late. And she resigned herself to her fate. Here I must lie as the pigs slobbered off in their filthy mire somewhere into the pig pen. And there she was, stuck. And the sun started to go down and it was getting dark and there she was and she thought, I'm going to die. Because of my foolishness, because of my uh, ridiculous uh, ideas and I'm going to die in filth. And she sobbed, bleating as only a sheep can bleat. And the farmer heard her cries. And the farmer came along, lifted out the sheep, pulled it with all of its might, and it took some time and a uh, suck. And the sheep, the little lamb, she was out. She was safe. He got the hose and he washed her down. She didn't like that bit very much. He got the hose and she, he uh, washed her down and... Uh, sent her along into the sheep pen and her mother took one look at her and said, Daughter, sheep, don't wallow. While it isn't a suitable title for my sermon this morning, I think we could look at Joshua chapter 23 and see that Joshua is coming to his people before his death and saying, Sheep, don't wallow. He is saying that God's people are a different people. 
And having been rescued, I think that uh, it, it, just in case you missed the spiritual application of that story, uh, I think it's a fairly obvious spiritual application. There are many people, and they are brought up in the right way, and they are trained to do the right thing, and they are encouraged in that way and given great wisdom and love to go in that right way. And they are told, like the mother told the little lamb, sheep don't wallow. And they are told of the painful consequences of certain pathways and certain things in life. But they are determined to go that way until what they thought was their greatest joy and their greatest pleasure becomes their prison and ensnares them. And there's only one that can rescue them and save them from that. And when they realize their fate, and when they accept their foolishness, and when they know who they are and they cry out, then and only then can they be saved. It's a picture of the gospel. But it's also a picture of backsliding. It's a picture of going the wrong way. And this whole chapter is about the possibility that Joshua is burdened about that the Israelites, once he's, he's, it begins by telling us in verse 1, he's old and well stricken in years. In other words, there's only two more messages that Joshua's going to bring, chapter 23 and chapter 24. And since I'm going on holiday for a few weeks, I thought we'd look at chapter 23 this morning and chapter 24 this evening so that we've... Uh, completed it so there's not a gap because there are uh, t there are three meetings in total chapter 22 he calls the Gilead tribes and sends them away chapter 23 here he is burdened not that they do not lose the blessing of God and that's the title of my message this morning not losing God's blessing and I'm going to give you four rules for not losing God's blessing in the next chapter he calls one last meeting before at the end of the chapter it tells us that he dies. It tells us he calls another meeting, one more. And you know, friends, you're in a meeting this morning and there is going to be a last meeting that you'll be in. Well, Joshua is conscious of that and he calls for a covenant commitment to God. And we'll look at that this evening. But in this chapter, this is the concern. That the Israelites, having been blessed so much, having been brought so far, don't lose the blessing of God upon their lives and upon their nation and people. I'm going to give you four rules. We're going to base them as we go through the chapter and progress through these verses. Four rules for not losing God's blessing in your life. Rule number one. Value what the Lord has given you. Value what the Lord has given you. He rehearses in verses 3 to 5 the progress that they've made so far. He reflects on the victories that God has given them, how much they have triumphed, how they have been made to be victorious. And here they stand, victors over the rest. Here they stand, free men at last. They've been taken from Egypt They've been brought out, and here they stand, prospered. In verse 6, he tells them, how much the Lord has given you. See, I, I've divided unto you all this inheritance. So he is telling them that the Lord has uh, given them victory. And in the next verse, how the Lord has prospered them in that way. And how, in the next verse, again, he tells them how victory is promised to them going forward. So he's made them overcome, he's secured for them great blessing, and he's brought them to the point where he promises them that all the enemies will fall before them. In other words, Joshua starts by saying, God has done great things for you. We'll see this evening that he also starts chapter 24 in the same way. Because the one is the negative and the other is the more positive. But in the one that's the negative that we're thinking about this morning, it is logical that if God has blessed you so much, why would you go back? If God has given you a new nature, saved your soul, provided you a full and free grace and free pardon and mercy... 
and taken you from the miry clay, as David the psalmist calls it, and put your feet upon a rock and washed you clean in the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Why would you go back? Is that not logical? And the first rule to keeping yourselves in the love of God, keeping your soul, fighting the good fight of faith, enduring hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We could think of other references that speak of the same thing. Persevering in the faith. The first rule to not losing God's blessing in your life is to value what the Lord has given you. You know who you are. You are the covenant people of Jehovah. The ones he has taken into his heart. For whom he has punished his holy son and made him sin for you. You are kings and priests unto your God. Brought into the favour of eternal, the eternal heavenly one. That you might call him father. And you are his son, and you are his daughter, and you are his child. He loves you. He has taken you from what you thought might be your delight and joy that turned out to be your prison. He has taken you from wrath, judgment, death, eternal death, hell. And he has taken you from that and he has saved your soul and he's put you on a rock. He's made you righteous. He's washed you clean. He's given you a new heart and a new beginning. Why would you go back? He has sacrificed what no one else would sacrifice for you. Will you, as Hebrews says, trample underfoot the precious blood of Christ? If you do that, there is no more offering for your sins. If you turn from Christ, if you turn away your heart after the vanities and emptiness of this world, it always begins when you stop valuing what you have. When you stop appreciating what blessing God has poured into your heart and soul. They could be physical blessings, practical blessings. As you can raise an Ebenezer and say, see what the Lord's done for me. How the Lord's provided for me. How gracious he's been to me. How good he's been to me. And you can raise up a hallelujah and say, hitherto has the Lord helped me. How good is the God we adore, our faithful, unchangeable friend. His love is as great as his power, and knows neither measure nor end. Tis Jesus, the first and the last, whose spirit will guide him, our safe home, will praise him for all that is past, and trust him for all that's to come. And the moment you stop praising him for all that's past, look out. That's one step towards backsliding. When you fail to appreciate that Jesus died for you and that he has called you to his eternal glories, his promised land. He's called you to rest beyond the river, to joys unimaginable. When you fail to appreciate that, that you're a child of the king, then look out. That's the first step. The second step, the second rule for not losing the blessing of God. Have courage to obey God's word. So rule number one, value what the Lord has given you. Rule number two, have courage, the courage to obey God's word. Verses six to eight. Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left, that ye come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of their name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, 
nor bow yourselves unto them, but cleave unto the Lord your God as ye have done unto this day. Now, verse 6 is a very interesting verse. Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left. Joshua was reminding them that God has not left them fumbling around in their own foolish way and wondering what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, which way they should go in the path of life. The Lord God has given them ample direction and guidance. He has shared with them the wisdom of heaven. He has told them, as the mother told the little lamb, sheep don't wallow. He has told them how to bring yourself to cursing and how you're to bring yourself to blessing. He has directed and guided them, given them a map, a chart, a compass to navigate their way through the misty wilderness of ethical challenges and questions and problems and uh, diverse wickedness and sins and false teachers and false gods that they will encounter along the way. He has given them his word. And Joshua stands here and he says something Very interesting that they need two things in order to obey that word. Number one, courage. They need courage to obey it. Why? Well, he goes on to explain in the next verse that there's going to be nations round about and they've got their gods and they've got their system and their ideas and their wisdom and their knowledge and their understanding and they can be very charismatic and very persuasive and very alluring because their religion seems to have a lot more freedom than yours and well in our religion you can uh, do this and do that and uh, it's fine Uh, the gods will still bless you in fact uh, in some religions the more wicked you are the more God will shine his light upon you and be good to you so come and join us they need the courage to stand up for the word of God to stand out from the crowd they need the courage to say no sheep don't wallow They need the courage to do that. So he says, be ye therefore very courageous. And that's the theme of Joshua, isn't it? Be strong and of good courage. And this is the last time he mentions this. Joshua's been strong and of good courage. Stand up for the Lord. Stand out from the crowd. Be different. He did that way back in the wilderness. When it was... Ten against two, if you remember, the only one that stood with him. And uh, mercifully, uh, Caleb was there to stand with him. But the only one that stood with him was Caleb. But he was prepared. He had the courage to stand up for faith in the living God. And in a world that hates, you're going to need the courage to stand up and say, no, I will not hate. I will love. And in a world that is greedy and selfish and mean you need to the courage to stand up and say no I am not going to be greedy and selfish and mean and in a world that is violent you need the courage to stand up and say no I'm going to turn the other cheek I'm not going to retaliate I'm going to leave that vengeance and leave that all with the Lord you need the faith and you need the courage to stand up in a world of drunkenness you need the faith and the courage to stand up and say no that is wrong And uh, Christians, you know, uh, stand up and they get attacked and they get ridiculed and they get mocked because they have the principle of God's holy word within them and they have the courage to stand up for what the Lord has said. This world, I'm not going to name everything that we're against this morning. That would be unproductive and unprofitable. But... For example, abortion. What's your view on that? As far as the Bible is concerned, it's murder. And it's wrong. And we're prepared to say so. And yes, we might be criticised. We're not anti-abortion. I tell you what we are. We're pro-life. That's what we are. And you have no right whatsoever to take away the life of an unborn child as murder. In the eyes of God. Do you agree? 
Sure you do. But would you have the courage to stand up and actually say that if, if it came to it? What about all the ethical questions surrounding LGBTQ and they put this endless list? I could go through the position of the Bible and you could say, oh, I agree with that. But would you stand up for it? I don't mean would you be controversial for the sake of being controversial. Be wise as serpents, be harmless as doves. But what I mean is you're going to need the courage in your life to stand up for the Lord. Otherwise, you're going to backslide. That's the second principle, the second rule. Uh, value what the Lord has given you. Number two, have the courage to obey God's word. Number three, always go in the strength of the Lord. Verse 9 says, For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong. But as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. I said to you that in order to obey God's word, they needed two things, not one. And I mentioned that they needed the courage to do that. But it also goes on to say that they needed to cling to the Lord. And unless they clung to the Lord, unless they clung hold of the Lord their God, then they would fail. And he goes on to explain why that is and what he means. Cling to the Lord because the Lord your God fights for you. Cling to the Lord because the Lord your God will give you victory. Cling to the Lord because the Lord will honour you if you honour him. He will bless you if you worship him. He will do good to you in the end and ultimately. Uh, no one in all of creation, in all of history, is greater than Jesus Christ. Now the world hated Jesus and despised him and crucified him, but God always prospers, always exalts, always blesses, always ultimately vindicates those who follow his word. But it's the Lord. And that's his point. If you don't cling to the Lord, then how can the Lord help you? If you don't rely on his strength, how can he give you that strength? If you become the Israel, Israelites did this, in fact many have done this, if you become proud, vain, superior in your thinking and your attitude towards others, condescending even, we've all met condescending Christians who think, they're uh, better than the rest of us, holier than thou people. And if you become independent and proud and arrogant in any way, be warned, pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But lean on the Lord, rely on the Lord, cling to the Lord, trust in the Lord, be strong and of good courage. Where does that strength come from? Be strong in the Lord. And the power of his night, rely upon him, give him all the glory. In Psalm 3, David talks about how he is in the presence of all of his enemies. And he lifts his eyes to the Lord and he says to the Lord three things. He said, Lord, you are my shield, you are my glory, and you are the lifter up of my head. You protect me, you are the one who is worthy of praise, my glory meaning my splendor, my magnificence. It's not, it's not of myself. I give you all the glory. He humbles himself as a nobody and a nothing without the Lord. But you're also the lifter up of my head. And you lift me up and make me triumph. You lift me up and make me rejoice. You lift me up and bless my soul. You lift me up and guide my spirit. You lift me up and take me on my way. You protect me. You are my righteousness, my everything, my all, my glory. And you lift me up. He is relying on the Lord. And friends, every one of us 
if we would keep the blessing of God in our lives, we must learn to always go in the strength of the Lord. Don't rely on yourself, not even for righteousness. You know that you need to walk in a good way, in a right way. You know that the Holy Spirit will convict you if you go the wrong way. You know that. But friends, don't even rely on yourself for righteousness. Don't rely on, anything, on yourself for anything. Rely on the Lord. Lord, you give me the strength to get through this day. You give me the wisdom to make this decision at work or whatever. Lord, you show me what you would have me to believe or what you would have me to do from your word. Lord, you be my teacher. You be my strength. Lord, you help me to make wise plans and right decisions and choices in life. Relying on the Lord is clinging to the Lord, depending upon him. It's that symbiont relationship. We chose that hymn, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. And it's that uh, union that the Lord wants you to lean on him. The Lord wants you to trust in him. The Lord wants to be that support for you. That's the two clinging to one another. As the Song of Solomon puts it, who is this that cometh out of the wilderness leaning upon her beloved? And that's the church. We're leaning upon our beloved. We are leaning upon the Lord, relying upon the Lord. The moment you start relying on yourself, then look out. That's a step to backsliding. We see it in the history of Israel. There's your third principle. Number one, value what the Lord has given you. Number two, have courage, have the courage to obey God's word. Number three, always go in the strength of the Lord. Number four, and finally, let love be the basis for your obedience to God. Many people get this wrong. Let love be the basis for your obedience to God. Verse 11, take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God. Else if ye do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them and they to you, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. But they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until ye perish off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All are come to pass unto you and not one thing hath failed thereof. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all the good things are come upon you which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring you upon you all the evil things until he have destroyed you from off the, this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. He tells them not to turn back. Because if the Lord had prospered and blessed them and given them so much and driven out the enemies, if what the Lord has given, you need to remember, if the Lord has given something, the Lord can take something away. And so he begins in verse 11 by saying, take very good heed. Be very careful over this point. What point? What's so important, Joshua, that you would stand up in your weakness and your old age just before your death and tell us, what's so vital? Take very good heed. Watch your heart that you love the Lord your God. Because if love ceases to be the basis for your obedience and submission to your God, and it just is going through the motions, walking through the religious requirements, then you'll start to find that you'll conform, at least outwardly. And you'll have the semblance and the appearance that all is holy and all is well. And it'll all seem well to others. But what God wants is love. And not just any kind of love. God wants a relationship that is based upon the principle that as he loves you, you love him in return. And then when that bond is there, many things will result. 
And all the results kind of will take care of themselves. But when that bond is not there, all of those things are up for grabs. And the kind of love that God has is what I would describe as an all-in kind of love. It's not, it's not half-hearted. It's not kind of, well, I love you a little bit. It's all-in. That's how much God loves. He's all-in. I'll give everything for you. I'll sacrifice that which is most dear to me for you. I will plan and orchestrate and... Uh, Arrange all cosmic powers and forces to work for the good of you. I will arrange all providence and overrule every situation in all of the world and all that might happen in all of the world and make it work out for your good. I am an all-in kind of God. I love you and I'm all-in. And I want you to be all-in with me. That's the relationship. And... We fear God, not because he might punish us, but because we love him, and we don't want to offend him, and we don't want to hurt him. We love him. And when that love, when we appreciate how much he loves us, and we take it into our hearts just how great his love has been and is towards us, and we understand with all the saints in every place who want to know more of this, How high and deep and wide and broad the love of God is towards us in Christ Jesus. And as Paul said, when we comprehend that, when we take that into our hearts, then we say with the Apostle Paul, well, yeah, I've done this and I've done that with all the other apostles, but the love of Christ constrains us. He loves me. And I love him. So he says, why do you think Joshua was prepared to stand up against all the rest because he loved God. In his heart, he had a passionate, deep, loving relationship between him and God. And love was the basis for his obedience. And so when, in verse 11, he says, now take very good heed, be very anxious over this, be very careful over this, that you love your God else. If you go back, what he is saying is, That if you cease to have that loving bond, that relationship of love with your God, where you know and are profoundly conscious of his love to you in your life, and then you return that love with all of your heart and all that you are, then if you cease to do that, you'll backslide. You will. Could you say it's kind of a reaffirmation, I suppose, hymn? Could you say with the hymn writer, My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. Here's the rub. If you love him, for thee all the pleasures of sin I resign. As he is all in for me, The hymn writer is saying, I want to be all in for you. I love you, Lord. The psalmist says, I love the Lord because he heard my cry. And many of you here this morning can testify, the Lord heard my cry. I cried out to him as a rebel sinner and he heard my cry. He loved me. Well then, friends, take very good heed that love is always the basis for your obedience to your God. The chapter ends on something of a negative note. There's the positive too. It says, every good thing has come to pass. You know that. We already studied that a few weeks ago. I'm not going to go over that ground. Everything. It all came to pass. Everything God said. And here they are, Interesting this, they're at Shechem. Abraham stood in Shechem and God said, lift up your eyes and look at all this land. I'm going to give it to your seed. This meeting takes place in Shechem. Here they are, full circle, hundreds of years later, and they stand there and everything there, as far as their eye can see, they own it. 
So everything God said has come to pass. And be sure that not just the bad things, uh, the good things will come to pass. Joshua says, be sure that the evil things will too. If you go in a wicked pathway, if you live a sinful and backslidden life, if you are determined to go after other gods and uh, intermarry believers and unbelievers, and all, pain and sorrow and difficulty and trouble is going to come. If you're determined to cherish that sin and love that sin, that dear sin, that besetting sin, more than your God, there's a way that it leads. And while God is exceedingly patient, God is never mocked. You can't mock him. Make a, a nonsense out of him. Abuse the grace that he shows. So he ends on a warning note. Cling to the Lord. Love the Lord. Be courageous. And don't forget what the Lord has done for you.